Hello, everyone. Welcome to 75 Days of Partitions, Day 8. This is Gunita from the 1947 Partition Archive. I'm super excited today. Uh, we've got uh, Professor Rita Kotari here from uh, Ashoka University. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Sindhi experience, the Sindhi Hindus who left um, Sindh in 1947, um, you know, the challenges of managing identity and language when they're far away from their homeland and in a place where Sindhi is not the dominant language and not heard every day. So we're gonna, uh, so welcome Professor Katari. Um, so let, let me start out by asking you a little bit about, let's just start with your family history and you know your personal story and what keeps you uh, tied to the subject? Mm. Actually, what is surprising, Gunita, is not so much what ties me to the subject, but what, why it was a subject rather than a family lore, in the sense that the Sindhis, as I've mentioned elsewhere, did not actually talk to their families about partition much. And uh, for the longest time, many of our families, children like us, did not even grow up thinking of our parents as being parents who were products of this historical event. I mean, even in my case, it must have happened when I was almost in, almost 30. And uh, I remember going to a very, not a, not a therapist, but a, but a kind of a, counselor who had a self-taught kind of counselor, a Jesuit priest. Uh, and I was talking to him about some things that were bothering me. By then I had already, I think, finished my PhD uh, and I was working on a whole bunch of things. And I must have said something about how my parents uh, didn't get some things right. And I didn't grow up with a sense of stability and I wasn't particularly proud of the very mercantile community I belong to, where all that matters is money and so on. And he said to me that, he said, his name was Father Darrell. And he said, he said, Rita, surely your parents must have done something right. Look at you. And he said, and don't forget that they were partition migrants. Believe me, Gunita, that's the first time I actually thought about it. That when is said, fascinating. Yeah, when he said this, I began to think then that I was constantly thinking of the mistakes they had made, of the losses they had incurred, uh, the bad decisions they had made, but I did not think of the struggle they would have gone through in putting together what they had managed to put through. And I think it reoriented my perspective towards my family, just thinking about that a little bit. Then, of course, one thing followed another in the sense that at some point, a couple of years later, I was beginning to read books about Sindh. And then one of the first interviews I did was that of my father. And uh, I, I, by then, he had moved out of Ahmedabad. He was living in Bombay. And I went up to, I told him in that visit that I made in Bombay, I said to him that, you know, Papa, this time we used to speak in Sindhi. So I said, Papa, another Fetanjo interview at us. And by that time, Gunita, he was, this man had lost all business. He was almost un, he was unemployed. Life had, you know, there had, there had been severe challenges about his dignity, about his stability and so on. The fact that his youngest daughter, the one he admired the most, because I was the only one who was reading books, who was going to an English medium school. The fact that I was conveying some interest in his life was already a big thing for him. And he said, I put an interview at the image. So I said, nah, Dada, I only want to know kya, you know, ki kahan bade hue or... so he said, achha, achha, wait a minute. He went inside and he changed his clothes. 
and then he came out wearing the safari he used to wear lit up his cigarette and he said ha put up puchane like mm -hmm. abhi fascinating and then that was one of the first interviews i did and then he talked to me about that he were talked to me about what was he thinking about when did he leave shikarpur then he took a ship from karachi and so on and so forth i've written about all this but i think i want to talk to you today about the fact that when a younger generation that has been amnesiac about partition and when they reach out to older people what it does for them it absolutely you know, there's enough history of suffering already but the fact that someone has actually someone says that you know yes you suffered but maybe you have a worthwhile story to tell me that while i could not have suffered like you did but i still want to be with you i want to know what that was and i think that we owe that what yeah. the work that you do i think is important because we owe that to that generation we need to tell them that look we are interested in your stories we are interested in what and i think my father and my relationship which was a, a strange one also changed somewhat after this interaction uh so i did not continue to keep the tie in that sense i think i formed those ties much later yeah and i think these stories are actually a part of us because they helped shape our dna pretty much they helped shape uh, our thoughts because they shaped our parents and hence they shaped us so my question is was this the first time that you had explored this subject with your parents had they told you before that that you know we came from sin then you know so only like okay very rarely i would have heard of sin when like if it was raining a lot then my father would sometimes say that to my mother he would say kamla adi pakoda thayu ye sindh mein pakoda thainda hoya you know the sindhi pakodas are very famous and so only very rarely not at all otherwise not much the 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 occasions when these cities like larkano shikarpur and so on karachi and all hyderabad they figured a lot in matrimonial matters the endogamy the sindhi mm -hmm. practice is based so much upon geography that those names of regions they figured but we didn't know where the cities were gunita the way they were used it almost sounded like a caste mm. interesting right so in, in, hello I have no idea why I was knocked off. <laughs> that is really strange because I have very good internet here. Um, so I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, you were talking about you know yeah, so your parents. Just, yeah, we didn't know where these places were. The, all these were cities and you know towns of Sindh, but that is not the way they came over to us. The way they came over to us, it sounded like some kind of a very watertight caste system. And, very interesting i mean in terms of caste there was a fair amount of homogeneity that people the baniyas were marrying the baniyas and so on so i'm not saying that there was some amazing fluidity here or anything like that all i'm saying is that the geography played a very important role in in uh, in identity yeah in conveying a certain kind of hierarchy among the sindhi community but no people were not talking about sindh not much no was the hierarchy related to you know highly urban cities versus small towns kind of like certainly. it is today certainly yeah fascinating yeah. and you knew um, but you knew that your parents had come from sindh right you knew yeah, yeah yeah i knew they had come from shikarpur and i was made to believe that shikarpuris were the best people <laughs> and i was made to believe that everyone else was what the sindhis call gothana gothana goth is gaon मतलब सो देहाती सो बाकी के सब लोग देहाती थे बस हम शिकारपुरी सबसे वी वर द कूलेस्ट ऑफ ऑल एंड 
the only people we would concede to uh, were the Hyderabadi Amils because they are the very sort of, you know, westernized and uh, very educated people. So the Sindhis had, the Shikarpuri Sindhis had to concede to the Hyderabadi Amils. But otherwise, the rest was all riffraff. That's okay. the way we were, yeah. And where were you raised by chance? In Ahmedabad, in the city of Ahmedabad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Were there many other Sindhi families there as well? So in the locality mm -hmm. where I was living, it was a Sindhi colony. There were quite a few Sindhis, but this wasn't the refugee camp area. The camp areas are different. They are slightly, they are closer to the Ahmedabad airport. So they were on the outskirts of the city. Once people do well, then they come to the other parts of the city. They leave those camps and they come to the other parts of the city. Wow. So I'd love to, since we have short time, I'd love to kind of learn more about your journey now, now that we have a little bit of background about your inspiration and your very beginnings. And can you tell us about how you started exploring the Sindhi identity more and what your key findings were? So the period that I'm talking to you about, which is around the year 2000, and I, by that, by that time, I had just finished my PhD work, which had nothing to do with Sindh or partition or anything like that. By this time, I was already translating a Dalit novel from Gujarati. And I wrote my first, mon I was, I finished PhD, which then went into the first monograph called Translating India, the Cultural Politics of English. So you can see that it has nothing to do with any of this. But once I finished my PhD, by this time I had finished, I had, I had been married for maybe about, I don't know, 92. So I would have been married for about nine to 10 years. And I was in a very mainstream Gujarati family. And I saw how put together they were in the sense they had very cohesive sense of traditions. They knew where they were from. People mm -hmm. talked about their roots being somewhere. And I felt that I came from a very, very fragmented community. And I did not have this sense of legacy, a history, not an heirloom to speak of. They were just fragments. You know, it's almost like an entire history had been splintered and language and rituals and nothing seemed put together and nobody had. So I felt that there was already a certain sense of shame in being a Sindhi. And I wanted to understand whether other people felt that too. I began my initial research by interviewing young people and asking them, if somebody tells you, you don't look like a Sindhi, what do you feel? And there would be young people. I mean, I, when I'm saying young people, I was myself actually in my late 20s, early 30s. But even young students like 18, 19 year olds would say, oh, Rita, ma'am, I feel very happy if someone tells me you don't like a Sin look like a Sindhi. And mm -hmm. it was very clear to me that there was a relationship with this identity that I needed to study and understand. So my journey begins here. It begins in, in trying to find out who I was, in also trying to find out whether there were resonances of what I was feeling, whether those were there in other people. And somewhere along the way, the question whether this has anything to do with the partition experience. And while I was working on this, Gunita, the 2002 riots happened in Gujarat. And I came to know of the attacks that the Sindhis had made upon the Muslims. And I was thinking, I'm reading the partition accounts here, and I'm reading the histories, and they don't tell me about this kind of hatred. So then where is this hatred coming from? If it, is, if it does not lie at the time of partition, then where does it lie? And I think I got one very significant answer there, which is that some of it actually does lie in the resettlement history, not in the partition history. So I think I came to some of the very important observations which, which actually stand vindicated even today, of which one is this, that we do not account for the fact that when people were as immigrants, as partition products, when they were resettling in parts of India, the hostility they received from the host yeah. population has been a very huge shaping force and we don't pay sufficient attention to it. Secondly, I also learned, and that has also been a lesson that has stayed with me a lot, that, and I want to say this very clearly, I think we get so lost, Gunita, in the binary of the Hindu and the Muslim. What we don't realize is that sometimes that 
the fact that the Sindhis were the Sindhis that I am talking about were Hindus, but because they wore clothes of a particular kind, they came from a region, then that became Pakistan. They wrote in the Perso Arabic script, they exclaimed by saying Allah and so on, that to the to the more kind of Chust Hindus and Jains in Gujarat, they looked Muslim-like. And the hatred was towards this figure because the figure was very Muslim-like. And I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that the nature of our hatred is such against a Muslim that even someone who reminds us of looking like one, even as a proxy, that's it's almost a proxy hatred. And I think therefore we need to understand that this is we get lost in the binary, but we need to see that the roots are sometimes so problematic that they are manifest even against Hindus who don't fit into your scheme of things. So for me, people who think today that what is happening in India today is only about Muslims, they are so severely mistaken. They don't realize that it is not only about, it is about all of us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what I've found really fascinating from some of the Sindhi elders that I've spoken to is, uh, you know, the worship practices, the fact that there were Sufi peers that were followed, that the Sikh gurus were followed, that there were numerous Hindu saints that were followed. It's almost like the Sindhis didn't uh, yeah. confine to a particular or associate with a particular religious practice. Yeah, yeah. That was quite common. And in fact, it was, I grew up actually not really knowing whether the way more sort of textualized Hinduism people would know who their Ishtadev is, right? Who are they supposed to worship? On I grew up thinking of Guru Nanak and Ram and Krishna and sometimes even Jesus all in the same manner, thinking, you know, it almost seemed like it was a menu of spiritual options and you could take what you like. So the attitude actually towards godliness was very, very, for want of a better word, casual. But I think casual sounds negative. What I want to say is that it was very sahaj. And sahaj is a very important word in our traditions because sahar just means not heavy handed, but something that has a lightness of touch to it, something that you don't become too rigid about. And I think our relationship with worship and spirituality was sahaj rishtadha. And I think a lot of my emphasis in my writing and teaching about Sindh has been to say that we need to stay with that sahajta. We don't need to lose that. Well, what was your parents' view on partition? What has been their view on the overall experience and having to migrate? My mother was very little. There's a 10 year difference between my father and my mother. And so my mother was very little. She has very few memories. So her parents actually uh, brought her to Ajmer. So they must have taken a train from, you know, from Sindh, which came into places like Pali or Jodhpur or something. And they must have migrated to Ajmer. My father was a 14 year old, so he had a very clear sense of what was going on or some sense of what was going on. And he felt that he had not a single, not a single negative association with Sindhi Muslims. He felt that the quote unquote trouble, you know how Indians use these euphemisms, right, for uh, interfaith riots and he felt that the trouble was actually caused by outsiders. Now, what did he mean by outsiders? You know, that's Gunita. That's something that by now you know that it varies, right? And by some, by some people, some people would think of outsiders as migrants who came into Karachi and places like that after partition. But some people also have no notion. But the idea is that our neighbors and people whom we used to work with he was very clear about that. 100%. I think I would say like 99% of our interviewees of the 10,000 we've done, at least 100% of the people I've interviewed have said the exact same thing. Sometimes the people came from a few villages away, but they were not, they were not, yeah. they called them outsiders because they're exactly. not from their local village or local community. 
And so they were able to do this riding and looting because it was impersonal to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think he, he sort of must have told himself that maybe suddenly there was fear that something might happen to us. Maybe when you begin to feel illegitimate in a land, and so even if something hasn't happened to you directly or today, you you fear that it might happen any day or that there may not be a court of appeal or whatever. So I think the Sindhis left in with fear mm -hmm. and a feeling that there was illegitimacy to their to their being, to their existence back in Sindh. But they all know that it was, we know that it wasn't like Punjab. Yeah. Have you gone back to visit? Have you gone to visit Sindh? I did once. I couldn't get a visa to go to Chicago, but I had stayed in Karachi for some time. Yeah. And how was that experience hearing all the people speaking your language? My favorite visits ever. It means a lot to me. It and how was the reception? Me. It was so warm. It was the warmest, the nicest that ever could be. And uh, it's just unfortunate I couldn't get a visa again. But that one time that I went, I, I, I just wept at the airport. The moment I landed in Karachi and these three people who came to receive me put an ajrak around my neck and welcomed me and spoke to me in Sindhi. The very fact that this language has begun to vanish. We only speak it at homes and only a certain generation speaks it. That we've made it into a dialect. The very fact that people are coming to you and speaking to you in Sindhi, it already felt very different. You know, it just felt like, it just felt from going from Gujarat, it just felt like, oh my God, is this what it is? And yeah. uh, it was- Is Sindhi disappearing in uh, India or is it disappearing in Sindh as well? No, it's disappearing in India. In Sindh, there's a very strong sentiment and the Sindh region exists, right? There's no territory in, in India. And uh, the Sindhi nationalism is such a big force in Pakistan. Right. So no, it's not disappearing there at all. Uh, but yeah, in India, it has disappeared a lot. And what do you think is the way forward? Uh, I can see, you know, when I look at Instagram pages and stuff and I see younger people look very interested, they seem very interested in now suddenly, like there was a lull during my generation, but now I see that there are young people who are very interested in exploring their Sindhi identity. Uh, I think they pick up phrases here and there, or they will pick up sometimes even ways of like cussing. But I feel like I think they are trying to build some relation. I don't know whether it will ever be a language of intimacy, of history. Language is a reservoir of so many things. I don't think that will happen. I think what will happen is, Gunita, people will have bits and blobs of the language. Like they will know, Kisko sai bhaji bolte hai, you know, or that, Vadiu patata chavaras, kadi chavara. They will know words like that, uh, but will they actually know the idioms, the history, all of that, which brings an entire, through generations, I think there's something else that language does. That is difficult. What do so, you think? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's all right. I, I think I've, I've, there's a volume that Saz Agrawal came up with where I've written about language and I'm, I, I asked this question, then what does it even mean to be a Sindhi? And uh, there are many global cities, right, who are not speaking the language, but they are thoroughly comfortable and proud of being who they are. Uh, I personally, and this is a very personal view, I find losing a language actually one of the biggest losses. Yeah. I think it's, to me, that loss is bigger than losing a land. And would you like to explain why? What's the... Uh, what's the reason that it's such a big loss? I can imagine some answers, but I'd love to kind of know your thought process. Bunita, I feel like all the unspokenness of a history, of a tradition, of the journey that communities make through centuries, I feel all that is actually lives in a language. It does not, I think the rest is, the rest are piecemeal things. It's pastish. But 
It is language actually that carries the memory of an entire community. And if without language, I think you only have, you have a put together a curated sort of an identity, but not, not quite an organic one. Right. The language carries your cultural history. It carries, um, you know, a lot of the forces that shaped your ancestors. Yeah. And hence yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, that's really fascinating. Well, since uh, we're a little bit over time, are there any uh, final uh, thoughts you'd like to share? Any other findings from your research work? I mean, there's a tremendous amount of findings, I know, but any key points? I, I think I, I've also made an effort constantly to say Sindhi is not synonymous to Sindhi Hindu. I've written a lot about pastoral Muslim Sindhis in Kutch, in the region of Bunni. I've written about Sindhi Sikhs, right? the Sardars in Sindhi community. And I think my only parting, whatever, I mean, words like advice and all sound pretentious, but I think all I want to say is that let's focus on that linguistic term Sindhi and think of it as something that embraces the the Sikh and the Muslim and the Hindu and the upper caste and the Dalit and all kinds of identity in it. I don't think that we should be constantly only, I don't think the project about Sindhi partition should turn into a project only about a Sindhi Hindu experience. Uh, there are Sindhis who live along the borders of Kutch and Rajasthan and it's a very different story to tell. And that's a story I tell in this book, Memories and Movements, because there are people there who have been speaking for generations. It hasn't gone from their lives at all. Fascinating. So they're still speaking Sindhi. And it's no, totally, in totally, totally. They are closer to Sindh in, you know, emotionally, affectively, linguistically than urban Sindhis like us. And uh, Shah Abdul Latif, you know, it is, it's so much a part of them. Yeah. And I think uh, we need to pay attention to these difference in these. Right, right. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on board today. Um, do you want to tell us the names of your books? Um, and especially actually the one where you discuss the Rajasthan Kutch experience? So I think the basically there are three books that I depending on what. I think if people want to know about Sindh and overall about the partition experience of the Sindhi community, uh, among my books, I think The Burden of Refuge would be a good book to read. The Burden of Refuge. Yeah. And the second one is Memories and Movements, Borders and Communities in Bunni, which is about the pastoral communities in Western India that I was talking to you about. And if people are interested in literature and short stories, then I've translated Sindhi stories from both sides of the border. And uh, it's, it's a very lovely volume called Unbordered Memories. So these, I've written tons of papers also, and, but in terms of books, these three are the ones that people might want to look at. Okay, thank you so much. Hopefully our audience members um, who are more curious will go out and purchase these books and learn more. So thank you so much for joining us today and I look forward to being in touch. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.